Bye, everyone. Hi. Good to see you. Good afternoon. We're so Thanks. glad you can join us uh, on this cold day. Hope you're all safe and warm. Uh, we want to welcome you to go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat, uh, your name and the organization in which you work. Uh, we could see from the list of people who registered that we had over 78 organizations represented. Uh, so we're really excited about meeting you all. Uh, my name is Avital Keitsadok. I'm Haruv USA Director. And with me on this call today, on behalf of the Haruv USA team, we have Esther Stafford, our staff assistant, and Meg, our GRA, and Dijan, who will introduce herself in a second, our coordinator. And we're all on this call just to help out and make sure everything goes smoothly. So uh, we're really excited about this. Dijon? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dijon Knapp, and I am the Haruv USA coordinator, as Avital shared. Um, and I'm really excited that we all get to be here and share some space together with uh, my friend and colleague, Julie Kulpitz. Um, I first met Julie when the Oklahoma State Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence hosted Julie for some workshops here in Tulsa. Um, I believe it was 2019. And Julie was one of the first people who started talking um, about exposure to vicarious trauma, um, organizational responsibility in that, and how we take care of ourselves in the midst of all that in a way that I felt like I could really hear and digest and felt applicable for someone who was working in 24-7 crisis work at the time. Um, not only was she talking about fight, flight, and freeze, but this tend and befriend concept, which I don't know if she'll talk about today, but um, it was really impactful to me. And so I'm just really, really excited to have Julie with us um, today. And I'll let her introduce herself further if she would like to, but I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Julie. Thank you. Um, and thank you both Avital and Dijon that I've worked with and having a chance to talk to you folks in Oklahoma and talk with you again. It's really frustrating not being in the same room. Um, I really liked the conversations I've had over the last three or four years I've come to, to Oklahoma because we sort of co-created the experience and we don't get to do that today. Um, so I miss that. I encourage you to use the chat. I can't guarantee you that I'll see everything that's written all at once, but I love taking a look at it later. And it does mean that you can share your ideas or your thoughts with other people that do have a chance to read it and look at it. So we'll pretend we're together in the same room um, and see if we can develop as much of that feeling as we can. Now, I came to Oklahoma originally as part of my work for the National Network to End Domestic Violence. And for then, for those years, I was traveling oh, about two weeks out of every month and kind of just parachuting into different places in the US to support the work and lots of times as a problem solver. And people taught me an enormous amount. One of the things that I learned is that access, politics, cultural beliefs, and all of that might be different, but the core values that those of us who work in the nonprofit sector, particularly those of us that work directly around responding to violence of one sort or another or violence prevention. You scratch all that superficial stuff away and we're all the same people. Um, we have a commitment to something that matters deeply to us and we're working hard to try to make that happen. While the New York, New York, New, G New England Yankee that I was, wasn't immediately acceptable in Alabama by about the first round of bourbon or the first sense of being able to sit and talk together, we were all talking the same language. The other thing I learned, um, and I use that metaphor that you hear all the time, where law enforcement or first responders or firefighters go running into the building when everybody else is running out. What I learned about the people that I encountered and probably myself at the same time is that we're doing a psychological version of that. We are constantly running into the psychological burning building when everybody else is doing their best to avoid those issues, to not deal with the conflict, to not hear the terrible stories that you routinely take in. What I learned from that too is that people treated it as if it was another day at the office. Okay, get up in the morning, feed your kids, drop them off at daycare, go to work, here, truly horrible stories, try to dissociate from all of it, 
pick up your kids on the way home, you know, if you have kids, if you don't, whatever you do on the way home, have a glass of wine, maybe relax with your friends or colleagues, watch Netflix, go to bed, get up and do it all over again. As if it were something that everybody else did too. And use yourself all of the time as a tool in the process. Because we expect a lot of ourselves to listen to all this, turn it off and act like it's ordinary and every day. So I mean, really seriously, thank you for doing that. It's courageous. Um, it's incredibly important in the world. And it also sometimes gets a little dangerous. So what I wanna to talk today about then are several pieces. One is the recognition that this work, however committed we are to it, is not exactly risk-free. And the second part of it is we could do something about that. So I'm gonna flip back. Um, I know from a lot of my colleagues that they like having something that they can look at and take in visually, as well as hearing what I'm saying audibly. So we will have a PowerPoint up. You can read it. I don't tend to read it necessarily, um, but it will be at least a reference point for that. So give me a second just to share the screen and pull that up. Um, in this, we're going to be going through some of these concepts pretty quickly. I know that Haruv is really working hard to respond to requests from folks that are similar to this and has a number of lectures and other kinds of projects lined up. So we're gonna have a little bit of a smorgasbord about ideas. And at the end of it, there are references to everything I've talked about, as well as options if you wanna pursue any part of it further. And you'll get those slides um, in your emails. All right, so let's do this. So I want to start with a story, being an old Irish woman, you start with a story. Um, earlier in the 2000s, I had a chance to work for a year as the interim director of the National Center for Equine Facilitated Therapy, Horses and Healing. They had gotten a large grant and they needed someone who could come in quickly and be able to grow the organization, which was tempting because I'd lived with horses all of my life. Um, but the piece that really attracted me to it was that we had the option of working with the Palo Alto VA, working with returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. And initially we were working around physical wounds and hippotherapy, and then gradually we began moving into the unseen wounds of war. The notion of coming back with trauma that wasn't immediately visible. Now, we were so gung-ho for this. We organized it, got grantors to give us funds for horses. We bought these wonderful little fjords, for those of you that know horses. They're little small golden draft horses who are loving and kind and giving. And we dedicated them to the program and we dedicated staff to the program. And we got up and running. And it was be working beautifully, much better than we had anticipated, fewer kinks in the system. We also noted that they tended to be all of men, but these young men were hanging around the barns afterwards. They weren't leaving when their session was over and they were bringing their buddies with them and they were hanging around in the barns and grooming the horses and being with them. And we began to notice and get somewhat used to seeing these, you know, four years back from the war, just leaning into these horses with their heads up against them and just stopping and sometimes tears and sobbing and other times just the resonance. And these little beautiful animals would turn and literally wrap their necks and heads around these men and hold them. And we didn't interrupt, we let it be and began to wonder about what was happening in those moments. Well, about a month into the program, I was walking through the barns and I noticed that the horses seemed to be ill. They were standing with their heads down. They were off their feed. Um, they weren't running around in the pasture frolicking the way they usually did in their off time. So we did what you would do. We called in the vets and they cleared them, nothing wrong, no virus, nothing they could find. So we looked at the feed, we looked at every piece of it and Suddenly one day the light bulb went off and I went, oh my Lord, what have they been absorbing? What's going on here? 
Well, the barn staff mostly laughed at me thinking I was the renegade therapist, but we tried it anyway. These horses had been used to ill people, but to giggly little children with cerebral palsy or older adults happy out in the outdoors recovering from stroke, they were not used to what they were absorbing. So we changed our model. We gave them half time with the giggling kids and half time with the veterans. And within about two weeks or three weeks, they were back to themselves and we'd learned something. And then we noticed that the same thing was going on with the staff, that they were having moods and feelings and images that they could not explain and they didn't understand. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to go back in some ways and think about who we are as an evolutionary neurobiology perspective just for a moment. We started out as prey. We were not very brave things on those original savannas. We were skinny little frail things that didn't have big, huge teeth and didn't have huge claws and couldn't protect ourselves well. But we had two advantages. We had bigger, more complicated brains that could think about and work out individual survivor strategies. And we had socialization. We had a pack to share the work and to support our safety. Individual and pack safety have always gone hand in hand. And we use those things, that evolutionary advantage to end up now probably as the apex predator, but certainly to survive as a species and as individuals. There were no invincible lone rangers as much as Yankees and Westerners like that notion. We were embedded in socialization as part of our survival. So today, today in this idea about how we're gonna share some ideas, what I'd like to do is to look at this through three focus points. One is trauma in the individual. What's the new information that identifies predictable patterns of trauma response, including trauma contagion as vicarious stress or compassion fatigue? What's the role of the pack in this now? What about traumatized organizations? And organizations that are what I grew to call trauma influenced, which means they handle and absorb and are changed by trauma all the time but they're not truly trauma informed in that they don't take that knowledge and turn it into a pattern that promotes safety and compassion satisfaction instead of compassion fatigue. And then the third thing where I want us to end up together is what to do about it. And those will be mostly ideas that I've learned and taken some from other people's knowledge, but a lot from those years that people like you and I work together. Um, how do we address this and how do we deal with this? So who am I talking about? Staff and organizations whose work is with primary stress, advocates, clinicians, law enforcement, medical staff, others, and staff and nonprofit organizations whose work is to help with society's problems, but do it with too many competing needs and too few resources. So their organizations are always stressed, if not traumatized. And to be honest, all people in organizations providing services during pandemic traumatic stress. So consider the presentation today through the lens of pandemic traumatic stress. Now, I don't know if most of you think about the pandemic as being an occasion of traumatic stress or not. Um, and just so we can orient ourselves, is it? Is it pandemic traumatic stress? Well, let's go through our quick little checklist and you can answer yes or no. I can't see enough of your faces, so you can do that for me. Um, possibility of death or serious injury, check. Out of our control, we can't take effective action to make it stop, check. It requires constant hypervigilant and risk assessment. So it exhausts our brain leaving less energy for normal life and maybe sometimes a little brain fog in there a little more forgetfulness than usual. Chronic and the ongoing nature of it makes every day feel like Tuesday. Tuesday is not my favorite day. And makes our future timeline really unclear. We don't know when and if everything's gonna come back to normal. Is it isolating? Okay. 
Does it arouse our emotions and make it a little harder to stay balanced? Maybe some of us notice we're out of our window of tolerance a little more, maybe a little more irritable or cranky, or sometimes just feeling a little spacey and zoned out because we just can't listen to anything more about it. Have we developed patterns that respond, that constrain normal life? Because in that hyper or hypo arousal, we could be overreacting or we could be underreacting. We could hunker down and cope, or we could run screaming into the streets. Either are possible patterns to deal with it. Does it perhaps damage our trust and faith in authority or in the people that are supposed to help us? I think so. And again, does it isolate us then? And does it hold real grief and loss, not just of people who may have died or been seriously injured, but loss of this time in our life? loss of these experiences of graduations or weddings or just Sunday dinner? And does it change us in our world so that it's not the same after as it was before? So if your answer to some or most of those is a yes, then I hope you are really giving yourself an enormous amount of compassion for the fact that we are living right now in complex and ongoing traumatic stress. So let's back up and talk about and talk about primary traumatic stress, okay? Um, the first hand experience of incidents that are potentially lethal and challenge or overwhelm our abilities to respond. When traumatic stress happens, our very survival is threatened. We use that word loosely Oh my goodness, it was so traumatic. Well, no, it was probably uncomfortable or difficult, but unless in that moment you really were at risk, it's something a little bit less. Um, when traumatic stress occurs, two things that really are important happen. Our brain is an organ that's dedicated to the effective action. It's all about taking action. And it's organized around survival those two basic things. When traumatic stress happens, our survival is threatened and we can't take effective action on our own to stop the threat. And second piece, the pack isn't there to help us. Socialization doesn't help us, it fails as well. So we experience being overwhelmed with fear, terror, rage, whatever, along with accompanying helplessness. And when the brain can't respond in that way, both the brain and the body change. Our brain has had this experience. It's not the same world. So what we live with then are two pieces. We can make trauma incredibly, incredibly complicated. And the neurobiology of trauma are very complicated. But in, a re in reality, it's about two things, arousal and patterns. Now, what I mean by arousal, which is the first part of the problem, is that these are these terrible, upsetting feelings that flood us and make us incapable of responding or contribute to that. They're real. And that arousal is stored in our body. We absorb it with deep body-mind connections. So the arousal is the first part of the problem. What happens with that, you know, the negative event, Survival is the core value. It activates this threat defense system, which dumps adrenaline, cortisol, other hormones into our system. All of that goes on in our lower brain, the survival brain. And it prepares us for survival threats to the body. Now, if we respond and react and survive and our brain takes over and our bodies react, it's exciting and it's worrisome, but it's very different than what happens when you don't have an effective action. Because then, it becomes a primary response system. It overrides the upper brain, it overrides the logical system and it keeps happening. Now, what I mean by that is that this arousal, I'll come down here to the next one here. It begins to cause extreme arousal patterns. Sometimes these old memories or this worry comes back to us as something as dramatic as a flashback of a piece of an event in our face happening right now. Other times it returns to something more subtle, discomfort, images, heightened awareness, 
the brain sending us these impulses and feelings to get us away from whatever looks dangerous, whether it really is anymore. Again, with hyperarousal, a flood of anxiety or fear, or hypoarousal distancing it, leading to numbness and disconnect. But what goes on is that driven pattern of arousal responses hijack the upper brain and create physical reactivity and decision-making by trauma. Traumatized may, brains make traumatized choices. The body reactions, this holding of all of it also sets the stage for illness. It accumulates in our body. It threatens our immune responses. It exhausts us and it creates the thresholds for later chronic illness. So for an example, say that I am desperately wanting to be in love. A normal human state, right? I wanna find someone to love, I wanna be in love. And yet, when I get close and intimacy begins to emerge, that arousal, that reminder of a former time when I was assaulted or I was harmed or abused in some way, overrides completely my ability to stay there and I'm out of there, I'm gone. That the wish to love will always be secondary to the wish to survive and there I'm stuck. Because these patterns that we begin to see or talk about, they function still as they were protecting us from survival or from danger. And it doesn't matter how dysfunctional they are in the present, they'll take over and run anyway. And they'll, they'll literally hijack us. So what starts to happen in these patterns? Because now the brain is all about creating neural networks and patterns that have two purposes. One, to keep us out of any danger. And secondly, to keep us away from those memories of that terrifying arousal from the past. So cognitive changes, our attention gets hijacked. Chronic hypervigilance, or spacey zoning out, but mostly chronic hypervigilance, alerts. We scan the environment for the dangers that we just know are gonna be there. And we begin to develop a focus that's easily hijacked by anticipated danger. We colloquially call it trauma ADHD. There's not much energy left over for math class. Um, when I used to run residentials, we would refuse to diagnose any youngster coming in with ADHD till we had them in our company for at least a month and they could calm down enough to we would know whether it was the intrusion of trauma that distracted them or whether in fact they had a neurological wiring problem. Now the content of thought changes also. Schemas and networks of meaning, sense of self, whatever language you use to talk about the thoughts that you hold gets distorted. The world becomes an always dangerous place where I'm alone, I can't trust anybody, or the opposite, I'm never safe alone and I'm anxiously attached because I'm not safe alone. And no matter what I do, it's never enough because at the end of this trauma road is breakdown and helplessness. And these patterns, as I said, persist and they hijack control when they're triggered, whether they're functional in the present or not. So trauma on this level is really very simple. It's arousal and that it's every pattern that we put in place to protect us from future danger or to protect us from the memory of past terrible experiences and helplessness. Okay, we on board with this? Good, all right. So I love the NICAM illustrations. I want you to look at this just to give us a sense about then how do we function. Um, our drive system, Think of it as the adult ego, the functioning part, whatever you wanna call it, that gets everything done in the world is usually sort of the biggest piece we have going on. We have a small threat system that luckily manages those threats, helps us protect ourselves, survive, seek safety, but it's fairly small. And we have a soothing system that calms us down when we do become upset, that allows us to live in times with creativity and comfort and kindness and care and all that good stuff that makes life worthwhile. But in a situation where trauma, particularly trauma, which has been constant and ongoing, 
exists, that red glowing system becomes enormous and it hijacks our energy. And the soothing system shrinks down because this presence of alarm actually makes it harder for us to calm down and we forget how to do that. So the drive system, it's trying to do its work, but it's distracted by hypervigilance, it's distracted by pieces, it has a harder time calming down and getting busy to do the pieces of it, so our capacity in the world is diminished. If we think back to the veterans that we talked about initially returning home from war, they needed to enlarge their threat system. They needed to have a huge, giant hypervigilant muscle to keep them alive and well, or to contribute to their safety. So that they come back with this huge, as I said, hypervigilance muscle and an atrophied calm muscle. The metaphor I use with them often, because we're, I live mostly in a place where there's boats and water, is if you ever tried to row a boat with a giant muscle on one side and a weak muscle on the other, what do you do? If you've ever done it, you go in circles, don't you? You can't get there. The drive system doesn't kick in and you can't move forward and to continue this water metaphor in this icy weather. We're mostly rowing upstream in our lives. So when we can't make progress, we get swept away downstream, away from our goals and away from our destinations where we want to be. So this is what we just talked about. So why not calm? Why isn't it just easy for us to calm down once this little sucker of a system's gotten kicked in? The survival brain resists calm. And in a way it makes perfect sense because the hypervigilant brain experienced soothing and calm as dangerous. It's taking our way away from survival scans. And if we're not watching, the, the, it's gonna get us. So there will be an innate resistance to anything that promotes calm. Trauma is hot and sticky in the advertising vernacular. It's hot because it is just primary survival. It's sticky because it doesn't go away. It stays entrenched and it's consuming. Now, it's something else too. It's contagious. And this is the piece that starts to make sense of why the horses and the staff begin to look as if they too were involved somehow in traumatic experience. Now, I mean, I'm sure you've all walked into a room at one time or in your life where there'd been an argument just before you got there and you can literally feel it in the air. We read the people around us, we read all of that. Now, we used to, back in the older days, not have neurological proof that this was going on. So we called it energy and it was seen as a woo-woo and it's a suspect. But now with functional MRIs, we can literally watch the parts of the brain that light up in primary trauma also light up when we're exposed to the feelings and the stories of people when they tell us about their trauma. We call it mirror neurons that literally mirror the reaction of the other. It's what we use when we're raising little babies and we have attachment and we're connected to each other. And that wonderful intersubjectivity goes along that helps their self develop and helps us grow. But here it backfires. And what we're mirroring is not the joyful connection to a loved one or a child, but the reaction of the traumatized other. And it creates a muted trauma response. And over time, a muted PTSD-like response of arousal and adaptive patterns. In fact, it does. It will impact everyone because that's how we're wired. That connection, that contagion of trauma is unavoidable. We soak up the world around to us, whether we want to or not. And it's not because we're weak, it's not because we're inexperienced, and it's not because we've had our own trauma in the past. We soak it up in our bodies, we soak it up in our emotions, it changes our thought patterns and the worldview arousal patterns. It impacts our relationships. But the good news is, is while we can't stop it from happening, 
we can certainly manage how it happens and what the impact is. We can keep it from becoming symptomatic, and we can actually use it as an invitation to growth and strength. Is it a traumatic helplessness? Or can we change our frame of reference and our whole response by seeing it as a challenge and an invitation? Because trauma is an invitation. It asks us to know ourselves more clearly. It asks us to see ourselves more clearly. And it invites us into a different kind of growth. So the downside of courage and empathy. I like Perlman's description of or definition of secondary stress, the negative transformation in the helper that results from empathic engagement with trauma survivors of the material combined with a commitment or responsibility. Because we don't just soak it up. We say, I'm going to help. We step into the danger. We step into it with a commitment of action. So while your brain feels like it's overwhelmed and powerless, we're saying ours won't. That we will figure out in company with you how to co-create a response that will improve how you feel and how you are in the world. That's a major commitment. And that's why I call it courageous in that sense. So I'm gonna stop for a minute so I can see your faces and get just a quick take. And then we're gonna talk about the next section of this, okay? So are you with me so far? Yeah, on board? And stuff you pretty much know, but just saying it together so that we can share that sort of shared groundwork. Yeah, okay. Um, any you know, quick questions or... All right, we're good, we'll go back. Because the next thing I wanna talk about, we've been talking about the individual trauma. What about the pack? What's its obligation? And what are we doing with it? Okay. So most of us are running a business while we're changing the world, right? We're not just selling something simple. We don't have an easy task. We're out there to change the whole darn world. No stress, no pressure, not at all. Um, when I was traveling, what I would notice, and more and more I noticed, as the Fed sent me to work with organizations that were compromised and were stressed and were often not meeting their compliance requirements, which is how the Feds knew that they were stressed, I quickly realized that these very bright, competent leaders and staff, they weren't having trouble with compliance or infrastructure because they couldn't read a grant or a spreadsheet. There was something else going on with them and their organizations that was getting in the way. And to make a long story short, I quickly began to realize that organizations are just systems. Organizations can become traumatized as well. And what I began to see is that even though these folks would tell me, oh yeah, we have the training, we're all trauma informed, that what in reality they were was trauma influenced. They were working in the context of violence and abuse without realizing and taking seriously the impact it had on them. And they were being driven not only by negative consequences for themselves, but for the organization as well. Now where trauma informed means working in the context of violence and abuse, but knowing the impact and assessing and taking action to avoid the negative responses. By the end of today, I want us to have a bunch of scenarios where you can know that if you do see some trauma influences, that you have the ability to figure out how you want to move toward post-traumatic growth instead. So stressed organizations or traumatized organizations, sometimes it's actual traumatic events. You can say it was that suicide or that assault or that something else that traumatized our organization. Immediate trauma and chronic exposure to repeated traumatic or stressful events. In fact, in the new DSM, for those of you who are clinicians, repeated exposure to traumatic stressful events um, in the workplace as a part of your work is now considered as a primary stress event and not even vicarious. It's part of the PTSD um, diagnosis. But we're gonna stick with calling it vicarious. 
But the, the tricky thing is that long-term exposure for stressed organizations to not enough resources, too many needs for very important work also creates a kind of trauma. And the other thing that you're all, I bet, doing now that creates traumatized and stressed organizations is taking on new external requirements like COVID-19 responses or major mergers or major changes in how the work is done, a new statute, a new requirement, something you haven't done before, but you have to do now because we're flying the plane while we're still building it. And we don't, they don't say to us, oh, stop, stop, take six months off, build the new plan. They say, keep doing your work. And by the way, flying the plane while you're still building it. So what happens then? What are the themes? Because I began to see consistent themes emerging wherever I went. And uncannily, stressed organizations looked very much like stressed individuals with the same issues around arousal, and around subsequent patterns that they developed that helped them manage the arousal and focus on getting through, but didn't help them on, on growth or calm. So as we go through these, see if any of them, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like go to the, on this continuum of mildly stressed all the way up to terminally traumatized. I'm gonna overstate some of it. So if yours isn't quite at that degree, put it on the continuum where you might see it, all right? So what did I see? What do we see? For arousal-based organizational responses, a lot of the work that we do really is about life or death. It may be about sexual assault or domestic violence, or it may be about feeding people or housing people or homelessness, all of those things that are life or death issues. But the arousal starts to make us see things as life or death even when they're not. That ambiance is there. So it really isn't all that important who did the dishes or who moved the coffee maker, but damn, the arousal blows up. Or who has the office that you wanted. Any of the little things start taking on an importance that they don't deserve. And these can play out again, either in people being revved up, overreactive, crisis driven, or being burned out, numbed, protectively jaded and cynical. Lead in or fade out. And it certainly needs to reactive decision making. Productivity, in our world, there is really more work that can ever be done. That trauma feeling of no matter what I do, it's never enough. Well, it lives right in the reality of our work, but we take it personally, like we should be able to do it. It's a full tilt boogie work style. I'm running as fast as I can. So that for so many of us, overachievement can become the norm. We're really good at it. People love to have folks like us work for them because we get a whole lot more done than they expect us to. But we can also become attached to that whirlwind. And long-term hyper-productivity or high productivity by overachievement sets up exhaustion long-term. Our timeline is focused on now, fast, done, next. We rarely take a lot of time to celebrate the accomplishments that we've done because the next tasks are right there waiting for us. Okay, you did that, great. What do you do for me today? What's going on now? The next woman's at the door. Communication can lag or be ruptured. Clear boundaries and roles are compromised. Now this is especially true when you have new staff coming in through change or mergers. You're trying to figure things out again, building a plane while flying it. Sometimes we end up with a kind of trauma bonding that feels good in the moment. I don't know about you, but all too often when I go to some of the, particularly when I was working in DC on the national scene, I had to go to all of these awful cocktail parties and events, which tells you something about my introvert self being having to deal with this. But I would find myself almost always in the back room or off in an area talking with people that did the same work that I do. I found them because they're the only ones that got my jokes and we resonated the same way. So factions form. Now in the normal world, you have sort of an 80-20 rule that if someone's with you 80% of the time, you forgive them for the other 20% when you think they're wrong and a jerk. Um, that goes out the window sometimes with this all or nothing us them thinking. So if someone isn't perfectly in line, they're doing the work wrong. 
or they're not as good as, they're not as perfect an advocate as I am or as woke a person as I am. All of this begins to develop. So the initial trauma bonding can end up in splits and separations. People also start personalizing the system's problems. They start blaming each other or bonding with each other against someone else when it's really the problem of the system. Somebody doesn't know the roles because that's not how they do it where they work. Well, that's a system problem, but they start to look like a jerk because they, they put you in an uncomfortable position. And you don't like that. You don't like working with them. And authority can start to feel like power and control instead of something you trust or rely on. Ruptures of trust and challenges to leadership are inevitable when this goes on. And we burn through executive directors in our field like nothing you've ever seen. Or we have them stay forever, usually at a cost. Now, I'll take a risk and, and make the joke. When, when some of us in our dark humor as consultants needed to gear up to go into another difficult organization, we used to notice that sometimes organizations actually embody the trauma that they're dealing with. That when I would go into sexual assault organizations and they didn't necessarily like what the feds had to say before we got past it and could work together, I was intruding on them. I was forcing myself upon them. I was stuffing something down their throat. I was all of these metaphors. And in the domestic violence organizations, I was an unyielding, horrible authority who I used coercive control. So there's something about the flavor of the trauma that embeds itself in the work. So what else happens in our love, beloved organizations? People burn out, either through physical illness and we have staff turnover. We also burn through a lot of line staff really quickly. Or we have long-term devotion to the mission with high costs and our boundaries get blurred. We can begin to confuse our identities with our mission, particularly true for survivors and neglect other areas of our life. Now, I have to own up to a lot of these, particularly during these years when I was flying crazy amounts of hours and not taking breaks. I became, I became she who goes out on the mission. Lots of other parts of my life got lost. And sometimes taking care of ourselves can start to be an emotional struggle of loyalties. Do I have the right? to say, no, I won't help. No, I'm not gonna do that. No, they may be in trouble, but I'm taking this week off. Do we allow ourselves to do that? Run harder, they said, you'll be fine, they said. So that's the arousal and patterns part we've been talking about. What about the structure? What about riding the crisis? Because that's what the structure starts to become, riding the crisis. Crises take priority, structures don't hold, meetings and other routines break down, strategic thinking is replaced with reactivity. We have a strategic plan, it's called doing things. So the work, the people, the world around us, the place itself create this incredible intensity that we begin to absorb. Now these last 15 minutes that we have are so, I really wanna talk about what are we doing Track and manage arousal, intentionally change patterns, interrupt the trauma push and find the time. If we accept the inevitable trauma dynamics of our workplace, it's not just an individual problem. It's a system problem and a system responsibility. What do we do as individuals? Well, traumatic stress creates a power, a sense of powerlessness and negativity that overshadows the positive. We lose track then of another reality, which is that trauma is part of life. It happens. And when managed successfully, it can actually create growth and strength. So we overlook post-traumatic growth and compassion satisfaction when that traumatic stress takes over. Clinicians, advocates, we're really guilty of that sometimes. It all becomes a question of what we feed and what we believe will save us. So what are we gonna feed? And what do we believe that will save us? Dijon, here's your tendon, be friend. We're not gonna do the longer version of this that Dijon liked. But the interesting thing is the traumatic pieces and the responses we've talked about fall into what I call the F words, fight, flight, and freeze. But there is another way that people respond 
that takes us a different direction. Most of the research that's been done um, was done on men in warfare and was done about fight flight and then freeze was added. But even in that genre, it does not explain everything. It does not explain the soldier that throws himself over an exploding landmine to save his colleagues or runs up a hill into danger or any of those moments where we step into the danger. No, why would anybody step into the danger? Um, a group of women resource, researchers in California in the early 2000s, and there's a, there's a link to their article at the end, um, began to observe what they thought was a gendered response. Now we know it's not, but initially it was seen as a female response. That women not necessarily fight, fight, freeze, for, uh, sorry, freeze, but actually organize themselves to step into the danger and protect their children or their offspring or other people. And by doing that, they calmed down and got focused and reacted in protective and saving ways in the same way that fight, flight, and freeze. So they suggested this notion of tend and befriend. Now, I would expect that a number of us sitting here today are tend befrienders, whether we knew to call it that or not. That the way that we feel calmest is to step into the chaos, organize it, make sense of it, and take action. It's not a bad thing. In fact, it's a wonderful skill. And again, everybody wants people like you on their staff. The only time it becomes dangerous is that if it overrides our own ability to take care of ourselves, Because tend and befriend left unchecked means that we tend to sacrifice our needs on behalf of other people. And it plays right into compassion fatigue. Because that's how we feel better. That's how we feel in control. But tend and befriend analyzed, looked at, taken out as a successful mechanism teaches us something else. How do we take the power out of this threat defense system, this blinking red circle wiring us? We're also wired for calm and compassion as a survival strategy. Tend and befriend is a survival strategy. We just need to let our brains know on some level that arousal is really not the best way to survive long term, that it exhausts us, that it leads to everything we've talked about, that our best chance for long-term survival is calm and tend to befriend and compassion as a survival strategy, which brings us back into socialization and the pact. How do we turn off of the overactive threat system? We activate the care system. Negativity bias means that we constantly ignore the vast reservoirs of positivity around us. We overlook them and we move forward. So for an individual, it's track and regulate arousal. The best thing we can do about that is notice the arousal, learn our red flags, interrupt that trauma push, calm the body, calm the mind. That's our obligation as individuals. And what does that look like then? What's our skin in the brain? So I want to go down to those, we literally start to tune ourselves to notice and then interrupt that arousal, to calm the mind body with a conscious practice in the moment so we can make rational rather than reactive pieces or decisions. We build in patterns and practices that support calm because just taking a day off doesn't do it. And what I mean by that, I'm gonna come back to the examples in a second. What I mean by that is that in that moment, you don't have to be a Zen Buddhist to become mindful. In fact, I jokingly talk about what I call with clinicians, clinician mindfulness or with administrators, administrative mindfulness. What you need to notice is something's going on here. Something's gets, getting charged. Something's getting aroused in me first. And then mindfully step back in the action of stepping back either literally or in your mind interrupts that trauma flow, stops it cold. Step back from it, figure out your own little mechanisms to calm yourself down in the moment. And then you can come back and take an action to reroute that crisis impulse. So it's a kind of mindfulness, but it's not coming with all of the requirements to meditate. Now, if you can do that, great. But for those of us that aren't so great meditators, there are other strategies that we can begin to use to manage that sense of arousal. 
So what do we have at our fingertips? Body-based interventions, breath work, movement, sensory soothing, bilateral stimulation. So literally, when I find myself in a, a chaotic organization where the arousal is high, I just let myself notice it's starting to mirror in me, stop, breathe, step back for a minute, see it in others. And when I come back in, I'm calm. And there's nothing like one calm person to begin to help other people calm down. Now, all these things that I'm talking, breathwork, movement, sensory, do I don't expect you're gonna know all those, but there are links to every one of those in the, as we move forward. So you can go explore them. And I encourage you to go play. Netflix boring one night, go play with some of these. Try them on for style, see what works because some of them can be incredibly simple. Four part breathing, four times a day, lowers blood pressure, lowers heart rate, and clears the mind. Some are just that simple. Now, does that solve the whole problem? Of course not. But it begins to get us in a gear where we're not over aroused. Now, the body mind interventions, well, you're adding something else to it. You're taking a body, but now you're adding the cognitive body mind. The simplest one is to put a different feeling in the place of the arousal. So you've stepped back for a moment, but that arousal is still a little. You literally, by putting a different feeling, what I mean by the mo most ordinary one people use is gratitude. Think about something you're grateful for or think about something you love. That doesn't undo the bad stuff. We're not getting all wishy-washy Paula Anna here, promise. What we're doing is taking that moment because the moment your brain feels that positive gratitude, love, an image of something that you just love, a safe place where you feel happy and good. It changes the hormones that are cascading through your system. The nice thing is that when we're exposed to positivity or gratitude or love, the same way that the trauma is mirrored, these are also mirrored. So that that moment in our mind, we begin to mirror an experience as if it were happening, that moment of goodness. And it rewires our body. It reduces the arousal and literally may save our lives long-term because it changes what is going on in our bodies that leads to disease. And we engage compassion. Those simple interventions make huge changes. So I'm gonna suggest these are some, I, I've did a lot of training around technology and domestic violence. So I was looking for low cost or free things that survivors and advocates without a lot of money could use. So I, I really success, suggest any number of these. The funny thing is in our pandemic stress, Headspace and Calm are being provided to all the billionaire, um, high tech, by all the billionaire high tech companies to their employees so that they can become more functional at work. You're in good company. This is not woo woo anymore. And they're robust apps. They're really fun to explore. They're fun to use. And they have pretty quick impact. Remembering, of course, that initially your vicariously trauma-driven mind is going to say, that's stupid. Don't do that. That's dumb. It's not going to work. Because it doesn't want you to relax. It's afraid when you do. Reassure it and move forward. And because it takes a while to learn how to calm down again, Stick with it for a little while. Give it a little time to work. The Apple Watch is a great example of how to track arousal. It'll tell you when your heart rate goes up. It'll tell you when you start breathing quickly. It'll tell you these pieces of it. So take a look at these. Now, self-care, we've got just about enough time to open this up. Yep, six minutes, okay. <laughs> so how do we take care of ourselves and our organization? Because self-care always has two dimensions. Building resiliency has two tracks, ourselves and what happens in our pack. Now, self-care is usually seen as an individual responsibility that's ours to do after work. I don't see it that way. As long as the organization rides a systemic dysfunctional wave and feeds the crisis, individuals will get pulled in and pulled under. It's up to the pack to do its role, which means that self-care is not what we do after work. Self-care is how we do the work itself. Calm the body, calm the mind, calm the organization is the first part of the arousal. And the second part is organizations need built in rituals and structures that build compassion satisfaction and counter compassion fatigue. And if you're not getting that, stamp your feet, jump up and down, get aroused in a helpful way because you'll be helping everybody. 
Recognize and assess the problem is the first step. In your resources, you'll notice several different places that provide an, anal an analysis of an organization where you can fill in all the nice little pods and blanks and check marks and get a sense about yeah, how trauma-ridden is our organization. Override and move from powerlessness so you can intentionally start to change patterns and organizational structures. Stop rewarding riding the crisis. Identify and change those patterns is what we need to be able to do. So what do you need to thrive in this middle ground? You need leadership that understands organizational stress and is committed to taking effective action, overriding a sense of helplessness. You need buy-in from some people, but not all of them. There's going to be any number of people that say, oh, no, no, this isn't me. I'm the Lone Ranger. I'm just fine the way I am. I always think that talking about it from a compassion and a resiliency standpoint is helpful for those folks because you can say, fine, I'm not going to challenge your defense. You're fine. But how about the people that aren't? Are you going to help me help them? And usually they bite. And lots of times you will find people that have developed really good strategies and you need their input because what you develop will be special it will follow this pattern of managing arousal and changing patterns, but it will be specific to the plate that you work. So creation of calm space in the whirlwind. Do you have a sensory space? Are your meetings calm? Do you focus on what went well? Do you end a session by asking, because they're usually all the trauma stuff, what went well in that? When was that youngster connected to you? What were the moments that reminded you why you do the work you do? Where's the compassion and satisfaction? How do we build it? How do you encode all of those things into your styles of engagement? So when someone starts to go blah, 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 all the bad things that happened to their day, you say, I appreciate all that. And I'm really, really, really willing to hear that you're overwhelmed. But can you also tell me something that worked for you? Because I'm really not sure I want to absorb all of the trauma of your day. I recognize it. I acknowledge it. I know it existed. And now let's just take a breath here together. And that's how I can be most helpful to you. And you build compassion satisfaction to counter that compassion fatigue. So commitment and understand there will be resistance to change is always a part of the process. Crisis will do its damnedest to pull you back in. And it is a dancing, lovely addiction until it dissolves you and wears you out whole conversations. Now, the secondary traumatic stress-informed organizational assessment, which is a mouthful, or a similar tool will really help you take a clearer look at this. Talk with staff, get their input, assess the positives and challenges for your specific organization. Are you, are you in fact, building a new plane while you're flying? And what does that mean? You change the energy. If this becomes a challenge and not something we're stuck with, it's amazing how that care system responds. And we can take small persistent steps forward. Okay. So take calm seriously, because it really is only about finding the calm in the chaos. And those are all our resources. Okay, I got you on board. Superficial, fast tour through. But if you're feeling any of these things, you are not only normal, you're courageous. And now the question comes, how to use these, whatever you find as these calming devices to lower your own arousal, change your own patterns, and how do you help your pack? What do we do with them that creates that sense? So on a icy, stressful piece of a day, I really appreciate your interests um, and your commitment and your willingness to sit here together with me. Um, I think we're just about at the end of our time. If there are, in fact, questions or pieces that you want to send in to um, either Avital or Jishan, we're certainly glad to provide some uh, responses. I know it's giving you a lot, but play with some of the links and see whether there's something that captures your imagination and brings you back to your entitlement to be joyous and present in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Julie.
You are welcome. Good to see you again and to see a couple of other familiar faces in this mix as well. Yes, same. So for everyone who's here, thank you for joining us today. We will be sending out Julie's slides um, later today or tomorrow. Um, and yeah, we appreciate everyone. We hope you'll you'll keep in touch with Ruv USA as we continue to host um, various trainings and lectures and we'll look forward to next time. Absolutely. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye.